I don't know that there's been a team in the league that's faced more adversity than this team. And these guys have found a way to have success. You don't always get associated with a group that has the chemistry that this group has. And when you do, you know it's something special. The defending Stanley Cup champion Penguins, are they the favorite to repeat this year? I think they're the best chance to get a back-to-back -back set of cups than we've seen in a long time. When you're part of something that's bigger than yourself, it's a special feeling. And I know these guys have it right now. Fucking grind, boys. It's gonna be worth it, though. Be skating, helping each other, talking out there. Yeah. Listen, let's embrace it. It's one game in front of us. Let's make sure we play the right way, keep our energy up. Let's have a night here. Oh my goodness! Oh, stop the car, Mabel! It's over! And you would have to be here to believe it. The Pittsburgh Penguins could add their names into the record books, becoming the first team in the salary cap era to win back-to-back -back championships, also becoming the first club to repeat since the 1997-1998 Red Wings did it almost a decade ago, allowing Sidney Crosby to cement his legacy as one of the clutchest performers of all time. Jason Mackey is the Penguins beat writer for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. He joined me on Thursday to recap Pittsburgh's historic run. So first of all, Jason, I want to take the time and welcome you uh, to the Two Men Advantage podcast, and we're excited to recap the Penguins' run to their fifth Stanley Cup with you this morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So Jason, you recently wrote an article detailing the fact that the seed was sort of planted earlier in the offseason with the Penguins before they started uh, training camp when they adopted the mantra, why not us? So I'm wondering uh, if you can start off by telling me how that mantra sort of uh, carried the Penguins throughout the course of the season. Sure. Um, you know, and I, I wrote about that, why not us, sort of detailing a, a conversation on day one of training camp. But it's funny, we just had the parade in Pittsburgh yesterday and at that moment last year, both Jim Rutherford and Mike Sullivan said, Ben, you know, we'll see you back in a year. And so honestly, the seeds were probably planted even earlier than I wrote. But about that story and how they kind of have been talking about that all year, Mike Sullivan sat everybody down and said, you know, everybody's telling us we can't repeat. Everybody's saying that nobody's done it in the salary cap era since the 97-98 Red Wings. And why not us? And this team, uh, through a bunch of different things, sort of picked up a chip on its shoulder, whether it was the loss of Chris Letang or, you know, a lot of people said that, I don't know, they, they were too old or they couldn't score or there was a, a leaky penalty kill or anything like that, and they just kept sort of banking on that belief. Why not us? You know, tell us we can't do something and we're going to do it anyway. And so they just kept sort of going back to that throughout the playoff run when things maybe weren't going as well as they would have hoped when they lost Letang late in the regular season. Uh, and it was just that they wanted to prove a lot of people wrong and, and they've done it. And now you uh, alluded to this in your first answer, but I'm wondering if you can elaborate on uh, how the pink one sort of overcame adversity. You uh, mentioned the, uh, the Chris Letang injury, and they lost their starting goaltender before for the start of the playoffs. So I'm wondering um, how uh, they overcame adversity and uh, propelled them to where they were yesterday during the parade. Yeah, um, I would say the Latang thing is the biggest. I mean, there was so much 
chatter around here whenever that happened about, you know, they can't win a cup without Latang. Can't do this without Latang. And, and sure enough, you know, they don't have a, a number one defenseman. They might not even have a, a number two or number three defenseman. They just have a bunch of guys that they might Sullivan call them a, a simple group, something like that. And it's true. You know, they don't do a lot of extravagant stuff back there, but they also don't get embarrassed. Uh, so that was one adversity they had to overcome. And you're talking about uh, Matt Murray going down with about eight minutes left, eight minutes left in warm-up for game one of the playoffs. And, you know, in comes Marc-Andre Fleury and, and whatever. And, like, Mike Sullivan loves to talk about mental things, like changing a mindset and, and don't blink and, and don't let things – affect us internally, and this team has done that better than many teams I've seen. Uh, they're able to put that stuff past it, and, you know, I could go into, like, little adversities, but you had, you know, Connor Sheary was out of the lineup, Carl Hagelin was out of the lineup, both as healthy scratch. Brian Dumoulin had a stretch where he was a healthy scratch and not playing well. Ole Mata, same thing. So uh, they had their fair share of injuries, they had their fair share of poor performances, um, you know, and, and the Latang thing, again, is the biggest, but that, that's what I would say as far as overcoming it first. And what do you think uh, this latest cop does for uh, Sidney Crosby's legacy? Yeah, I keep hearing a lot of this, like, legacy talk. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to, like, call bunk on it or anything, but to me, he was up there anyway. Like, he didn't really, like, you know, I could see where, like, a second cup was a proven ground for Sid. You know, like, if, if there's a there's a line between being a one-time Stanley Cup winner and a two-time Stanley Cup winner. But I don't know. Between that and all the other hardware he's picked up, like I wasn't looking at Sidney Crosby and saying he needed to cement his legacy. I guess the only thing it really does is he's always going to be in the discussion of the greatest players ever, and the more he plays the game, I think the more he's going to move up. But I think you got to put him into the category right now of the greatest winners in NHL history. You know, when I look at that like a – you know, I'm not going to put Mark Messier among the top five greatest players, but I'd probably put Mark Messier in terms of the top five greatest winner. Uh, and I think that, that puts Crosby there. It says a lot about how he leads his personality, his being a captain. You know, I think not long ago, Crosby wasn't getting enough credit for his leadership and the role he plays being in charge of this team. And I think people are starting to see, or maybe they've seen it for a while now and it's growing even more obvious, but just how important that part of Crosby is. Now, Mike Sullivan becomes the second NHL coach in history to win back-to-back Stanley Cups in his first two seasons with the t- with the team. So can you tell me uh, what you think uh, Sullivan brought to this team from a leadership perspective and what makes him so solid at what he does? I think the biggest thing that stands out to me about Sullivan is his ability to, I don't want to say rip players, but be critical of players and still have them not hate him. He walks that line so well, um, and he, he doesn't take any stuff, you know, whether it's a star player, whether it's a fourth-line winger, whatever. Like, he runs his ship. Now, the, the sort of caveat in that is he's going to run it with respect and honesty, and he, he always – says things like, you know, the players are the most important, it's a player's game, and he was a player, so I mean, he's, he, he doesn't want the spotlight for himself, but like, that's kind of the deal you make, that he's going to be brutally honest with you, and he's, you're going to do things his way, and then you're probably going to get some credit for it, and you're going to win, and whatever, but I mean, there's a lot of things that stand out to Sullivan, honestly, I could go on and on and on and on, uh, but his mental approach and that's, you know, what I just talked about is part of it. Another thing he loves to throw around the word resilience. I think a lot of hockey coaches do, but at the same time, Sullivan is able to create that atmosphere where there is resilience. They do bounce back from things. They don't, they aren't overly affected by losses or bad performances. They're able to move past them quickly. And I think that's a, a mark of a really good coach as well. Now, when we look back at this series against, uh, the Predators, what will uh, this uh, sort of series or Stanley Cup uh, play all of, in your opinion, be most remembered for or defined by? Oh, man, that's a good one. Um, I, I don't know if I could pick one thing, to be honest with you. Um, it may, 
give me, give me five choices. I can go there. I, yeah, sure. We'll do top five. <laughs> no, I mean, the goaltending issues of these playoffs was just great. The Mark Andre Fleury dynamic, Matt Murray coming in, playing so well. Um, what Crosby did, like his performance in game five, stands out for me. I think that won in the series. I think it won him the Consumite Trophy. Evgeny Malkin took a huge step forward in terms of his availability um, with media, his play on the like. It just feels like he sort of took his uh, career or destiny or perception or anything like that, just took it by the rein. And the other thing I would say, too, is Jake Gensel, their 22-year-old winger who comes up and leads the playoff field in goals. I mean, that's just crazy to me. And then the fifth thing I would say is just overcoming everything they did, doing this without Chris Letang and a bunch of six no-names on defense. So I don't know if there's, like, one singular moment for me, but, I mean, I feel like all five of those ingredients added up kind of gives the – that's what – those are the things that I'll, I'll remember most about the playoff. And talk to me about the parade yesterday. I know it's one of Pittsburgh's largest – crowds uh, in, in their history there. So talk to me about how excited fans are that they capped off this improbable run to their fifth Stanley Cup. Yeah, it's, uh, it was quite a scene yesterday. Uh, and, and I think more importantly, they estimated the crowd at 650,000, which I think was probably a little on the large side. I mean, not that I was counting heads, but you know, I've seen other parades and I've seen how this one compares and it seems a little bit high. But in any case, uh, everybody came downtown yesterday. Great parade, great time. And we left. We didn't have a single arrest, no incidents, whatever. Like, it was just completely peaceful and enjoyable. And so that was that was cool. But you know what? The, the buzz in this city for the Penguins, like, I, I hesitate to even say there's buzz because there's always excitement over this team. You know, I think everybody looks at Pittsburgh from the outside and says Steelers. And it's a football town and whatever. And, like, I... I for the most part, that's true. But the Penguins, with the way they've won and, and their brand and, uh, you know, all this stuff they do, and they're likable with players like Cross, Malk, and Castle, and Flurry and all these guys. Like, I mean, they are, I don't want to say they're challenging the Steelers, but, man, are they up there. It's not far off. And so, like, to say there was a buzz, like, yeah, there was an extra excitement because it's the Stanley Cup final. But Pittsburgh's always into this stuff. It's really you know, in my opinion, an emerging uh, U.S. hockey market, a place that you need to start considering on par with Detroit and Minnesota and or Minneapolis and, and Buffalo and all these places, like the, the strong U.S. hockey market. Pittsburgh has shown that it's right there. It's right there in terms of developing the Celtic like hockey, it's youth level, TV ratings, interest, merchandise, anything you could want, and, and the NHL team is winning. So, you know, there's a lot of interest, but I wouldn't say that it's all that different. In terms of market ability for the NHL, how important do you think it is for uh, stars like Sidney Crosby and others to be at the height of their game as the league sort of lo- looks for new and exciting ways to brand both the league and the pro- and the product they put on the ice? Well, I you know I think the NHL could probably learn a little bit from the NBA showcasing it. Stars, uh, you know, you, to me, I want to see Sidney Crosby playing offense and making plays. And you know, I don't, I don't care who it is. If you want to go Austin Matthews or Connor McDavid or Patrick Laine or you know, you want to see young, upcoming, exciting players, and, and they, you want to see them challenging people like Patrick Kane or Jonathan Taves or whatever. Like I want to, I want to see the premier offensive players be that way. Uh, I, I think the NHL where it kind of hurts itself is, one, allowing its stars to take so much abuse, and then, two, having things, you know, I, I feel like we've backslid a little bit too much, not necessarily clutching and grabbing, but in terms of stuff being called, whether it's interference or whatever, that should be called. We're not calling the rule book as much as we should be, and it's, it's limiting offense more than personally I would like. I would like to see more back-and-forth skating games, and you're seeing – Teams turn it into shot block fest, you know, and I, nobody, nobody's buying a ticket to go see a fourth liner lay down in front of a slap shot. It's admirable, but to me, you got to find a way to let your stars be the stars, and you got to protect them. I think that's what the NFL does right. I think it's what Major League Baseball does right. I think it's what the NBA does right. You know, the other guys, they're, they're a supporting cast, but I, nobody's, 
nobody's turning out to see the fourth line left wing. No offense to them, but you need to enhance the stars. And that's what I would like to see the NHL do. Now, Matt Collin uh, maybe has played his last game in the NHL, L- L- as you wrote in one of your previous articles. So I'm wondering how you thought the veterans for this Penguins team handled uh, this partic- particular run. Yeah, the veterans were a huge part of this thing. It's probably done more so than Cullen. Uh, I'll talk about him for a minute and go on, get on to the other guys. But uh, two years ago, Jim Rutherford brought Cullen on and, and thought he was sort of a piece that he had in Carolina, that he would be good for this run. And he absolutely nailed it. Uh, Cullen's demeanor, he, he's very endearing, but he's also instructive to younger players. He has no problem. Uh, you know, calling the team out whenever they play horribly, but he's also very praising when they win. It's just it's the perfect temperament for this team. And, you know, I do think he's going to move on. Um, everything I understand, he and his wife, they want to get back to Minnesota. Their three boys play hockey. They love it. Matt wants to coach them. And he just wants to be home with his family, and you can't be, be grudge a guy for that. So, you know, I think he had a great final two years to his career here. was hugely helpful, and, and all the guys were. Um, they had... You know, Chris Coon, it's four cups right now. You must be doing something right if you have four cups. But uh, it's a nice split on this Penguins team between veterans, Kunitz, uh, Daly, Ron Hainsey, guys like that, and young, eager players, like Brian Dumoulin, Oli Mata, Jake Gensel, Connor Sheary, Brian Russ, but that crowd. Um, you know, so you have some youthful enthusiasm, but you also have some veterans that can kind of rein it in as well. But, you know, Kunitz uh, is just, um, talking about work ethic and, and hitting and, and doing the dirty things, and uh, you know, I just I can't say enough what he's meant to that forward group. I, I do think that with Cullen moving on, they're going to try to pursue Kunitz for something greater next year. I don't think they want to let him get away, but uh, you know, they probably need a certain answer for Cullen too. And in your opinion, how do you think uh, this? Penguins uh, roster will change, if at all, going in. I think it'll change quite a bit. I, I think there's a few pieces that are going to be gone. Uh, I, I, a few of the guys I mentioned, Daly, Hainsey, uh, Nick Benino among forwards, uh, they're all UFAs. I think they'll move on. They have a few guys who are RFAs, and, uh, Brian Dumoulin, and Justin Schultz, and Connor Steary. I think they'll bring them back. Uh, as far as, you know, a lot of, Chad Ruedel is another UFA. I think they'll probably try to bring him back on the cheap if they can. Uh, you know, Mark Andre Fleury, with the recent news that he waived his no movement clause to go to Vegas, uh, you know, I think it's almost to me it's a near certainty that he winds up in Vegas. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think it's going to change quite a bit. I really do, and I, I think they're probably going to get even younger. They've got some guys in the minors who can come up and play, and they're going to do so on cheap contracts and afford them to do something else. I, I think they probably want to add some depth on defense, um, a third or fourth line center if Cullen departs. I wouldn't be shocked to see them go out and get that. And then as far as you know, bringing Chris Kunitz back on a little bit more cap-friendly of a deal, I think they would be open to that. And finally, my final question for you has to do with uh, the overall league as a whole and what you'll be watching for uh, this offseason. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I guess the a lot of movement. I feel like there could be a, a quite a few moves at the trade deadline or the trade deadline, the start of free agency. Um, you know, maybe the Penguins. I, I think you know overall there there should be a decent amount of movement here, uh, and I think the Penguins will get involved in it. And you know, I'll, I'll also be honest with you. I haven't paid attention to a bunch of league stuff. We've also been in the middle of a Stanley Cup run, so I guess. I know I'm staying general on you with a, a, an expectation that there's a bunch of movement, um, but you know, and I'm also paying attention to the Vegas stuff. I, I'm interested to see how that plays out as well. Well, Jason, we want to uh, take a few minutes and thank you for your insight on this historic uh, Penguin run, and we want to uh, uh, thank you for joining us on the Two Men in Venice podcast this morning, buddy. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.